Good morning everyone to the Savi Sands Juma Game Reserve. You are on vehicle with Sam Chevalier and Vian. We are off towards Sydney's dam to see what we might be able to find this morning. James is out, is the co-pilot this morning as well as Elvis the Eddie. Rebecca will be directing us this morning and giving us all the different questions that you'll be asking. Buffy is very much alive and well. He just had a little, or he or she, I'm not sure, just had a little bit of something to eat. And you can see on Twitter, I posted a picture of, of the bird to show that Kirsty is doing a great job of feeding as well as everyone else is going to be trying to feed the little, the little bird. And we had an exciting day yesterday. Everything from hippo out of water to winds howling and the temperature got to a very low degree by the end of the evening last night. As you saw, the winds were howling against those trees. The clouds were out in the sky. It's no different this morning. It's just a little cooler. We've got my beanie on and my big jacket and the skies are looking very, very gray above us. So we're sitting at around 15 degrees Celsius, 15 degrees Celsius, which is very, very cold. Hopefully, this morning, we can come around. Oh, it's 59 degree, 15, 59 Fahrenheit, so, so that's what that is. 15 degrees Celsius, 59 Fahrenheit. Thank you, Rebecca, for, for giving that, me that little update. So we currently on Buya Tele Access. James has got uh, rusty this, this morning, so he's probably going to make his way to Cheetah Plains. We're going to drive around Vuyatela a little bit to see if we can find any tracks of leopard or lion that have crossed out or into our reserve. And we'll make our way up to Bufelsuk hopefully at some point to see if that lioness has made any kind of movement over the last day. I'm guessing that she... Oh, we've got some Ellie's early in the morning. There go the Ellie's just in front of us. So we've just started our drive with a breeding herd of elephants. So they've probably just come from Sydney's dam where we are about to go. See them running off there. So this could very well be the same breeding herd that we saw earlier or yesterday. Let's try and, I'm going to go down in Parlor Road, just so that we might be able to get a, a nice visual of the breeding herd this morning. So it's been a cool night for them, so they probably quite enjoyed that coolness. Let's go and have a look and see how they are all doing this morning. As you can see in the background, the clouds are still in the present. The sunrise is not going to be as glorious as, as it was yesterday. Actually, how can I say that it hasn't happened? Here come the Ellies, they're walking across the road now. It's going to get to a position where we can see them. There they are. Quite a few of them, there must be at least eight, nine, or ten. Slowly grazing into the morning. One is just behind 
there's two behind the thicket there. There's one feeding behind those acacia thorns. Quite clearly see the acacias there in that screen. It's a large, what looks like a female that's walking out of screen there. Go. So that's the first sighting this morning is a large breeding herd of Ellie's. So they, as we just said, most likely came from Sydney's and now they're going to spend the morning browsing and grazing where they can. The temperature is quite cool so they'll be able to move quite a distance this morning. There was a little bit of rain last night, I thought you guys should all know. It's good that we had some rain. There's one that's crossing the road now. As you know, any kind of rain is well received here in the bush because the autumn months are now upon us and the winter months will bring very little rain. So anything that these animals can get now would be great. Here we go. First little breeding herd for the morning. Let's see if you can watch them one last time. There they go, off into the distance. See if there's any more walking across the road. Said they'll just be browsing. You can see them also grazing on the grass. So we're going to let this breeding herd. Oh, actually, hold on. There's a nice shot of an elephant just to the right that is browsing on. So we're going to sit with these elephants just for a little longer. And while we do that, let's go and see how James is doing this morning. Now, I know that's not a, a thing you normally see in the morning, everybody, but there is a story behind it. Good morning. My name is James Hendry. On camera today is Brian the Thumb Joubert. who will show you his thumb just now. And we're just as live as Sam is. Well, just about. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Talk to us here. What we think we found here is obviously a hole, but in it, I believe the long lost cousin of Pinchy Winer resides. And we're going to name this one, assuming he lives here, Squeezy Dyson. And he lives in a similar sort of habitat to Pinchy Winer. For those of you who don't know who Pinchy Winer is, Pinchy Winer is a freshwater crab who was found at a pan very similar to this one, a little way sort of to the west of the reserve. And uh, I found this hole yesterday, and I think it may well be occupied by another freshwater crab. So, Squeezy Dyson is what this one shall be known as. <laughs> and hopefully as the water arrives, or if some water arrives, we'll be able to see if indeed Squeezy Dyson is a reality in our lives. You're most welcome on our little jaunt this morning. My plan today is to head, do a little quick loop around where Karul had, her, Karula <laughs> had her two babies. She hasn't been particularly confiding with him over the last two days. We might be lucky, we might not, and then I think we'll probably head across to Cheetah Plains and see what the vast vistas of the plains of Mala Mala have to show us. Okay, on we go. There's the thumb. Hello, Ima. Um, Ima, you saying, why is it that we go out at this seemingly ungodly hours of the morning and then only in the evening, leaving out the most, leaving out the middle of the day? Ima, the reason is that this is when the animals are most active. Most animals are what we call crepuscular, which means they're active during the morning and in the afternoon. The middle of the day in winter, there are some animals moving around, but in summertime, it's just too too hot 
And so we move around now. This is when the predators are kind of doing their last bits of movement. This is when the, uh, the herbivores and other animals start to get active to eat and feed for the morning. And so that's the best time now. And then as we go into the evening, many animals will come down to have a drink after, after the heat of the day. And certainly the predators will start to get active during the course of the sunset. So that's why I'm a... In winter, it's, it can well be well worth moving out sort of the whole day. But in summertime, you no, know, it's very horrible in the middle of the day. It's just so very hot. It is windy, as you can see, blustery, 15 degrees Celsius, 59 degrees Celsius, Fahrenheit, sorry. And Lady Luga, you say Squeezy Dyson is the perfect name for that. For those of you who don't know why he's called Squeezy Dyson, well, the squeezy part of it, of course, is, uh, is entirely explicable. But his name, uh, Scott, who used to work with us, named the other one Pinchy Weiner after a guide who had left. And so I think it's quite a nice tradition that if you, if you find a crab, uh, you find a word for pinch or squeeze, and then you name him for the surname of the most recently departed guide. There we go, Squeezy Dyson. <laughs> and Pinchy Weiner's hat, you say you've never met Squeezy Dyson. Well, he, that's why he's your long-lost cousin, Pinchy. I'm sure we'll eventually bring the two together. <laughs> I don't actually know for certain that there's a crab in there, but we did have a good look in there yesterday, and I think there could well be. Certainly there's something living in there, and I don't know what else it would be. There's a very similarly shaped hole to the one um, I'm going to go down this way. Very similarly shaped hole to the one that Pinchy lives in, or used to live in. Pinchy, of course, may well be passé or ex. He had his house sat upon by a buffalo or an elephant. We might be having email problems, apparently, so please send your questions to questions at wildearth.tv. I'm not sure what else you would be sending them to, but questions at wildearth.tv. There have been a number of viewers uh, who have said that, well, who have written to us and said, why is it that I've been rejected, despised by Wild Earth, and why are you not answering my questions? And the answer is, well, we're not getting your questions. So we're going to try and sort that out. Not sure what the problem is, but certainly there are a number of you who have been sending through questions which haven't been answered and we're not rejecting you, I promise. Or, I mean, it's, we, it's not like our viewer numbers have leapt up to a million, so it's impossible to get to you. Uh, it is simply that the email seems to be struggling. Here are some flowers, Brian. These are those beautiful jasmine flowers that smell so very delicious. And why they come out at this time of the year, I don't know. I've yet to find what they're called but they smell delightful, and they've got that very distinctive trifoliate leaf. You can see there, though, it's got one, two, three leaflets on it. There we go. Lovely. Well done, Brian. Very nice depth of field there, like the blurry background. Beautiful. Mm, artistic, especially on a morning like this. Hmm? Well done. Smells like jasmine, everybody, like a sweet, sweet jasmine. Now, if we are going to find these leopards and leopard cubs, I suspect that they will be in some pretty thick bush or down in a sheltered drainage line away from this wind. Those cubs will be very sensitive to cool like this. It'll be too cold for them unless they're moving around. So she may even have stashed them in a termite mound somewhere. Nina, you want to know if we've ever had a small camera that we could lower into the hole, or would that be too intrusive? Um, Nina, I think it's practically possible. I think it would be a little intrusive. I wouldn't mind doing it to a, um, a, a crustacean like a crab, just to confirm that he was in there. 
but um, we don't have any at the moment, but it would absolutely be possible. I mean, there's no, if you've got a lens and some kind of connection on the back of the lens, you can almost certainly broadcast it. Now, I don't know if you were watching during Big Cat Week last year, but what we did have was a micro microscope. And we used the microscope to look at all sorts of interesting things. And that, I mean, you, you, it's not very far from there to one of those sort of spy cameras, you know, the sort of long, twisty things that you can push into other things. So I, I imagine at what some stage we'll be able to do that. The thing about the vehicle, though, is that um, it's set up just for the one camera. And I mean, eventually, we will have a system where you know, if we want to show you something on the ground, we'll just take the camera off the vehicle and then we'll be able to move a certain distance from it. It'll all be wireless and that sort of thing. But at the moment, it's pretty much where Brian is sitting. Not so Brian. Yes. Right, we're coming up on twin dams, which seems to be surrounded by three or four dams. Not sure which the twin is. And we'll just see if Karula is not gently playing with her cubs in the leaf litter of the giant jackalberry tree that grows here. That would be splendid, wouldn't it, Brian? Yes. Rather than just driving through the driving wind. It is very chilly today. It was very exciting when this front came in yesterday. I love the feeling of these fronts moving in. I don't so much love the feeling the next morning, though. It's hardly like you feel like Scott of the Antarctic, though. I mean, it's, it's not exactly that cold. Here's the jackalberry tree I was talking of. The jackalberry tree of which I spoke. So, she could be anywhere around here. Sandy, you want to know if we have four-leafed clovers? Uh, no, Sandy, we don't. We don't even have three-leafed clovers. We don't have clovers. I suppose you, uh, you do get clovers growing in a place like uh, Johannesburg. You probably get them in some of the pastures. I think they make good pasture forage. So pastures up around uh, in KwaZulu-Natal where they have sheep and dairy farms, you may well get clover growing, uh, planted clover growing in those pastures. But out here, it doesn't occur naturally. So this is the one of twin dams. Bugsy, um, you want to know that flower could be the white star jasmine. I'm going to look for you. It could be. I don't know. I'm really bad with wildflowers. That is the one dam of twin dams. And there's often a lot of confusion over, you know, what we call a dam and a pan and a pond and a, uh, I don't know, a lake and a waterhole. This would be a dam. You can see it is very obviously created by man. And uh, we're at Twin Dams, and there is a dam behind us which used to go across the Mlalawati drainage line over there. Let me just find Jasmine under J for Jasmine. Not so, Brian. It does begin with a J, doesn't it? Yes. Good. 225. This little book, which has... It's a general field guide. has got so many things that you wouldn't expect it to. Yum. No, it's not a wild jasmine. It might be a wild star jasmine, though. I'm going to keep looking for it, but it is a, there. I, that's the jasmine that we get here. But I think that's standard yeah, issue standard. jasmine. Right. Let's carry on, just round the corner here. That's Lex hailing me on the radio. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good morning. Um, you guys, uh, Samuel has said, go ahead, James, to Lex, who called me. Good morning. We have 
But flour is everywhere now. I'm seeing it more and more. I'm just going to quickly tell Lex where we went. There is an impala, everybody, our first mammal. The way I've been going with is not a gift horse to be looked in the mouth. Very nice. Very nice. Lex, we did twin dams, uh, nothing yet. Sorry, everybody. We just got to make sure everybody, nobody, um, redoes the the roots, so that we can cover the most of the reserve that we can. So male impala, two of them together, probably been fighting, and we had a wonderful sighting of a male impala yesterday, who looked at us like that one has, but he's got black eyes, and it looked like his face had been really bashed up. His neck and shoulders were so stiff he could hardly move, and that's from fighting. Lex and Chris, we did twin dams, nothing so far. Now we're round about where we thought Karula might have stashed her babies, so with any luck, we'll pick them up around here. Now that Impala sat up and looked at us like that because he heard the Twitter handle that was just read into my ear. Lloyd stole first. Hello, Lloyd stole first. Um, I wonder who stole second. Can you, uh, you want to know if we have any edible fruits here in the autumn? Well, we're in the autumn and yes, there are two or three edible fruits. The two of them that come to mind are the white berry bush, Flugia verosa, and the guari trees or the eucleas. And the eucleas produce a relatively nice sort of red berry with not much fruit on it. And the flugias produce a sweet white little berry, obviously it's called a white berry bush, that tastes like a sort of sweet pea. But this year, because the water has been so sparse and scarce, what you find is that those fruits have really not had nearly the amount of sugar that they do normally. And they've been fairly bitter and unpleasant. But those are the only two real fruits that we get around this time of year. The rest would come largely in the summertime. What a very nice question. Thank you, Lloyd Stoll, first. Let us go around the corner, Brian. Find the leopards lying in the drainage line. There is no evidence that the lion population is more infected by TB than it was before. And there were some random facts about what TB does to lions. But we've known that for years and years and years, so that's not new at all. We don't know if it's on the increase. We don't know if it's on the decrease. We don't know if it actually affects how long a lion lives. We don't know that. And we know that it's been here for many, many years. And so it was, it was just rather a... It's, it's great that they've got the new method to test, the, to test the lions, but it was just pathetically written up, even in um, some, some very uh, sort of eminent journals and things. So I thought it was very disappointingly done, but it will be interesting to see going forward what happens with that. Let's head across to Sam. He's got a gnu. To our right, we have a gnu, a wildebeest, that is standing on his territory. You can see that it is quite a chilly morning, both on the impala and on the wildebeest. They look like their fur is a little bit more buffed up this morning, because it is quite a bit chilly. And I've thoroughly enjoyed learning a little bit more about the wildebeest, how they, what they like to to graze, they really enjoy the big open areas where they have like colonial grasses. Where they can pick and, and, and eat some of the smaller smaller grasses out there. As you can see, watch it. So it eats the smaller grasses there. Something that I've found fascinating to learn is is ecosystem succession, which is you know the way in which 
animals are, are working together to graze the land. So the zebra will come in as a bulk grazer and will eat all the top grasses and, and pretty much eat anything that's thick and bulky. Whereas the wildebeest can really only eat that smaller grass that is below it. So they'll work together, which is really cool to, to understand. And you, you can kind of get a better reading on how ecosystems function and how you know, players in the ecosystem are working together to help each other out, whether they mean to or they don't. But this big wildebeest of here is a male and is holding his territory. So that's the way in which wildebeest social structure works, is that they hold territory and they wait for females to come through. James is sitting with a big bird at the moment, bird of prey at the moment, and we're going to see if we can just get past this wildebeest and find some tracks of some leopard. But if you have any questions around ecosystem succession, let us know a little bit later. For now, let's go see James. There, everybody, is an African harrier hawk a gymnogene and is about to be attacked by a fork-tailed drongo. Now this gymnogene I've seen around here before and he's looking on the dead tree there for a hole in which to stick his very flexible legs so that he might grab a chick and eat it for breakfast. Now watch his face his face is yellow most of the time, but we watched one the other day that was turning red and then yellow and then red and then yellow. And the books will dare he's being bombed. The books will tell you that they only do that when they're breeding. That that kind of red face occurs when they breed and we have certainly were nowhere near two of them. So I think it's very much an indicator of their emotional state. There, it's gone red. Do you see that? Ryan, shall I go back a little or are you okay? Let's go back a bit. It is jerky like that, everyone, because we are super zoomed in. So I will try and sit very still. Oh, and while we look at a large bird, let us not re forget Buffy. Now, Buffy, everybody, is a rescued red-billed buffalo weaver chick or fledgling. They're not a very good fledgling, who we found yesterday and there he's gone red. Do you see that? And Lael, he made it through the night. Uh, Kirsten fed him again this morning with uh, some egg yolk and he actually ate. So he might survive. The problem, everybody, is that Buffy and his shoebox seems to be have paralyzed legs and so he can't actually move his legs at all. His bodily functions are still fine, they, as evidenced by the amazing mess he's managed to make, but his legs are not in a good way. So he's either going to become a camp bird or a dead bird at some stage in the near future. If we can get him to start feeding himself, you know, then we can just catch a couple of termites a day and he'll be fine. But if he can't feed himself, I fear me, he's for the chop. Gone bright yellow. It, it alternates all the time between that pinkish red and the yellow. Wonderful bird. This is around where we were looking for Karula the last few days. No tracks of her coming out of this area, so we'll just do a loop around. Maybe we'll be lucky. And if you look above there, Brian, we've just got some streaks of blue coming through the sort of ooh, looks almost oil painted sky. You can hear just as the light improved, the birds suddenly started singing. They don't like to be silent for too long, our birds. I don't know if the cloud's going to break up at all during the day, but maybe it will. Isn't that subtly very beautiful? Hello, Leopold. A very nice question to which I have absolutely no idea the answer to. You want to know, if, given that these birds have got such powerful eyes, are they able to see distant galaxies in the night sky? 
Um, no, I wouldn't say they can. I mean, the most... We can see two galaxies other than our own, which, which is the Milky Way, with our naked eye. And that is... There's the Magellanic Clouds, which are two galaxies not too far from our own. The Andromeda ga Galaxy, I think, is visible through a, probably a set of binoculars. So maybe they can see the Andromeda Galaxy, but I don't think that they're necessarily able to see all the way to the edge of the universe with their eyes. I mean, they're not quite like telescopes. I think the definition that they see is really good, and they're probably long-sighted to the extent that they probably see probably maybe three or four times as far as you can. So, yeah, I guess the night sky probably does look very different to them, and they can probably see Jupiter's moons, for example, without having to use the aid of a telescope. It's a fascinating question I've that I've just never thought of. And James Richard, I don't know all the answer to your question. You say, why? I mean, what benefit could it be to the bird that it has these, that it flushes red like it does? With birds, there are so many colours involved that don't seemingly make any sense. No one has yet managed to convince me as to why, for example, a, um, a lilac-breasted roller, both male and female, should be so brightly coloured. I think in the case of that bird, it's probably much more communication than it is anything else. While it does change red and yellow when he isn't speaking or communicating with another gymnogene, it wouldn't surprise me that it was a, an evolutionary throwback to him communicating with a potential partner. Anyway, we might be lucky. We're not going to spend too much time around here. The light, of course, is... Here she is. She's on the road. She's come out of here and she's walking up the road. The great queen of Juma. Let's just see if I find a nice track I will show you. I don't know if she's got her babies with her at the stage. I just saw one track there. Keep your eyes out, Brian. easily go past them by mistake. Let's see. Hello Sandy, a very good question. You want to know how and the cubs. I'm gonna just go back a bit and see if we can't so that Brian can show you these. In fact I'm not. I'm gonna carry on because I think they might be just up ahead. Sandy, you want to know how on earth I can tell if they've just come by or whether it was last night, uh, yesterday morning, or indeed possibly last week? Sandy, the reason is that, well, it's, it's got a lot to do with experience. Most obviously, though, I mean, if something from the night has walked over the tracks, like a civet, if a civet has walked over the leopard tracks, then we know, obviously, that they come from you sort of early yesterday evening, if they've got a, no civet tracks on them or no night creatures on them, but they've got maybe a dove walking over the top of the tracks, then we know that they're probably from the morning because doves are only active in the morning. So that sort of thing makes it obvious. Otherwise, it's a real feeling. It's the definition of the track. Has it been blowing wind? What kind of substrate is the track on? Is it in, uh, you know, is it on this kind of really nice clay soil or is it very sandy which will change the definition of the track I think these are from last night sometime they could be from this morning we're going to drive slowly along here this is very exciting uh, <laughs> I don't, almost don't want to get excited they are still on the, they're still on the road here now she may well have killed somewhere not too far from here or maybe even in Torchwood we're not too far from our eastern boundary she may have killed and then be taking these cubs to her kill so that they can eat. Of course, today, well, tomorrow is their third month birthday, and so they should.
pretty much be weaned by now. They will suckle a little bit, but they will have to be eating meat now. Just going to call these in. Stations, tracks of Karula and at least one youngster moving east on Ledwood Road towards the big clearings with the knob thorn in them. Um, looks like tracks from, I don't know, middle of last night sometime. So we can't, of course, go on to Torchwood, but Chris and Lex can. They're driving out of Juma. Uh, the youngsters are still on the road here. can drive slowly. It's tempting to just go really fast. Oh, she came out exactly where we were walking around yesterday. She must have been just inside the drainage. Or she'd left the little ones in there and they were waiting for her. She's still here. She's still on the road here. The tracks are starting to look I mean, they look pretty distinct, and there's been a wind the whole night. So, I mean, these could be, these could be from now now. All right, let's head across to Sam while I have a look here. He's got a fascinating snake-eating bird to show you. Welcome back, everyone. We are on Arethusa now, and we are sitting with two secretary birds. Have a look at these birds. It's not often that I've seen them before. It's a new bird to our list. You can see how long their legs are. Have a look at the size of those legs. So what secretary birds do is they flush insects and all sorts of little, maybe little rice, uh, mice outside of the bush and they'll catch them. So they flush them out and it's very cool to see that. Hopefully we can see that with this secretary bird over here. I've only ever seen them once or twice, I think. Very, very, very cool bird to see. So they have very powerful legs and a very stubby pink padded toes. Can you see those toes from here? They like to eat also larger snakes and small mammals. So the book says that they also prefer the open grassland with long grass. Teresa Williams has just said that she's on 219. Teresa, I'm glad we could get your bird list up. I think I'm only on 25 or 26 on a live safari. Of course, I've seen more, but have to see it with you in order to get that bird list up. And what I've just read here is that they have very elaborate, elaborate courtship displays, dancing with raised wings. So there's two of them there. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll get to see a little bit of courtship, a little bit of courting. Long, long legs. Look at those legs. Thanks, James. We, James is quite excited that we are seeing some secretary birds. James, I didn't expect to see them either, but you know what it happens when you traverse on new property or new, new pieces of land? So we decided to go through to Arethusa today and just see what might just be walking around the airstrip and luck has it that we have two secretary birds. Just look, what are they picking on as they walk there? Let's see if I can get a little bit closer. I know that we're having a little bit of a signal problem, so please bear with us as we move a little bit closer. It'll be awesome to see what they're actually eating and how they're doing it. And most of the time when I've seen a secretary bird, those two times they just ran away. So this is a new experience for me as we move it all closer. So let's go together and see what's going on. I'm going to 
not talk while we're here, just because that might disturb them. Ooh, there goes this butterfly. Wow, that was awesome to see that. Look at the size of that wingspan. It's huge wings. Here comes the next one, running. There goes two secretary birds flying. What a fantastic sighting. That wingspan was huge. <laughs> well done, VM, to that camera work. So I might, have, I might have flushed them away as we got closer. They got a little bit uncomfortable as I started getting closer, but what, I really wanted to see what they were doing and eating. Um, but that was really cool to see them take off. It was almost like they were at an airstrip which we are at now. So they took off right next to the airstrip, the secretary birds. <laughs> secretary airlines. <laughs> yeah, that's a terrible joke. I know. What else might be lurking around the airstrip this morning? We know that there are jackals that have been seen around here. So I would love to see a jackal. Who would like to see a jackal? I would, because I haven't seen one yet. And I think our best chances of seeing anything would be a side striped jackal. Because it's a very, very, very harsh environment for a black back jackal, purely because of competition. There's a lot of competition for the black. Ooh, that's a bird we haven't seen before. That's, a, that's a, what looks like a Senegal lapwing. I don't think with this camera you'll be able to see it from here, but you definitely heard that Senegal lapwing. Is it a crown lapwing? I can't see from here. Could be crowned lapwings. Anyway, we can't see them with that camera from here, so we'll we'll have to get a good picture of it. I'm not writing it down. Robin Bull would like to know why they are called secretary birds. So definitely should have told you that from the first moment I saw them. Secretary birds, it, it is actually derived from the long part of their back here. So let's have a look quickly at that part of the, the back, because it's derived from back in the day when secretaries used, used to wear their pens in the back of their hair. So let's have a look at that. Let's see what that looks like. There we go. Here's the secretary bird, and it um, that looks that looks a little bit like a secretary with a pen in the back of her hair. I, I must say I can't see it straight away, but if I if I force myself to see a secretary with a pen in the back of her hair, there, I can't see that. <laughs> so it's a near near threatened bird. So the secretary bird is 1.3 meters, which is three to four feet. So that is how big a secretary bird can get. So Ginny was asking that. Ginny, it's quite a tall secretary, eh? 1.3 meters, three to four feet. Imagine the sec that secretary sitting in your office as a bird. Can't imagine it would file your notes too well. Maybe it would just eat your notes. <laughs> Steve, I'm sorry, my jokes have been shocking this morning. Didn't quite have that coffee that I needed. We were looking at trying to help Buffy and feed Buffy where we could. And Kirsty was doing an amazing job. So it does look like there are little tracks around here. There's hyena tracks that have been moving around this area. We'll just lurk around here a bit, see if we can hear anything alarm calling. Oh, sorry. What was that, Brian? Is she talking to me? Oh, dear, this is not good news. 
Final control, I'm afraid I cannot hear you. You'll have to relay your message to Brian. My earpiece seems to be in some difficulty. That is my earpiece. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, one second, everyone. Sorry about this. It just needs to be put back in, and then I'll be able to hear them. Okay, it's back. I'll have to tape it there. Go again. Rebecca, I can hear you now. Hello, Rebecca, yes. Natasha from Ontario, you want to know what the hardest thing about tracking is. I'm, I'm not sure I can tell you that. I think that tracking is an extremely hard thing at the best of times. I think, for me, the most difficult thing is seeing the detail. I've got uh, slightly, I mean, I don't want to say a condition, but my eyes are what we call monocular. So I don't see depth of field in the same way that some people do. So for me, it's very difficult to pick out very indistinct tracks. Otherwise, predicting what animals are going to do is very difficult. It's such an experience game. Some people have a real feel for it and others just don't. There's Chris. We're going to address him. Hello. How are you? Good prospects? Yes. Um, I haven't seen her coming out here. I don't know if you know the game path I mean, but there's one that comes off the clearing there. And it, I've driven to the end of it, and I don't see her coming out. Um, but I may have missed it. And I don't think it's a bad idea just to do a little scoot up Cheetah Cut Line there and see if she hasn't gone, gone over. Yeah. And then maybe... Cool. Perfect. Otherwise, she may well have just killed something inside the block here. Okay, for yes, first prize. That would be, certainly be first prize. All righty, see you now. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Kelly Miaui. Kelly Miaui. You want to know if leopard kills are less detectable in the winter time because of the smell? Yeah, I guess they would be. But remember, Kali Miaui, we get two things in winter here that you perhaps don't where you are. The one is sun. We get lots of sun in the winter here. So that helps with the rotting process. And we also have uh, no snow. It doesn't ever freeze. So. You know, although probably things rot slightly slower in the winter, I wouldn't say there's an appreciable difference. Just listening to the radio here. Now, this kind of substrate here, if we just look down the road there, Brian, that kind of stuff is very easy to track in because it's fine. It's fine-grained like clay. and you will leave a very distinct mark. But there isn't anything there. I'm going to turn around again, and we're going to go carry on along the road that we were on and see if she doesn't pop out there. And I did see a batelier flying, and with this camera, it will be such a lovely shot. Deborah, armchair traveller, you want to know about the sex of the cubs and whether that's been confirmed. James. Go ahead. Oh dear. You meters north of where I saw you, and they're moving north um, up the road. Huh? Okay, Gobby. I think she's crossed. She's on the eastern boundary at the moment. Not her, but her tracks. And so we're going to go, just follow up behind no, Chris. In case we get a view. They've gone, I think, into Torchwood. Dash. Oh. Anyway, let's just go and quickly look. Um, we know that one of them is a male. Deborah, we definitely confirmed that. The other one is smaller, and so therefore could well be a female. So I think we've got one male and one female. Chris, I'm just going to drive up the cut line behind you in hope.
So you can see Chris in front of us there. And Sandy, you want to know about tracker collars and if any of the animals in this area have got tracker collars on them. Sandy, they don't. And the reason for that is, uh, well, the reason that they do get tracker collars on them is in lo lots of areas is because of research. They normally put tracker collars on animals for research purposes. Here, we try not to do it too much. You do find endangered species like wild dogs with tracker collars on them. But out here, I mean, with a leopard like this, no, we wouldn't put a tracker collar on. <sighs> They've gone east, everyone. That's east, everybody. My only worry here is that there seems to be only one cub track. That's the worry. Chris, confirm you saw only one cub track? I didn't study it too hard. Okay. Um, you didn't look carefully. I'm, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't take no, too much notice there. Um, James, sorry about Copy. Good luck. Please keep us posted. Okay, so they're going into Torchwood. We are not. We're just going to cry quietly into our, into our hands. And I just want to see, let's go and look quickly if we can find the tracks of both of them. Now, Leopold's apartment, who I'm assuming is distinct from Leopold himself, you want to know about whether or not here, I'll show you the tracks here, let's see if we can ascertain whether we've got both the cubs. Um, you want to know what stage they'll start hunting for themselves They'll start making kills from about five months. But those will be very little kills. Scrub hares and gerbils and mongoose and that sort of thing. Okay, so. Can you see here, Brian? Here is mum. Here is at least one cub. One cub there, and definitely another cub here. One cub, one cub, and mum. They're both here. Whew. Unfortunately, they're in Torchwood, and we will not be seeing them today. Nasty, nasty lady. Been looking for her for so long. Oh, well. So it goes in the wild. And you know, that question about tracking collars and things is an interesting one. And I mean, these days, you could probably get a subcutaneous chip that would tell us, and we'd get an app on the phone that tell us exactly where they are. And I suspect that's eventually where we'll go with this sort of thing. Not, not us, but I suspect that's eventually where safari will go in a number of places. Um, will it remove the romanticism out of the safari experience? Absolutely. Will it negate the need for the traditional skills of tracking? Absolutely. Will it enhance the experience? I don't know. Will it make more money? Probably. But I just think it's great to be able to do this sort of thing where we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Marvellous. Samuel <laughs> has a... Well, I, I hesitate to say that he did it, but uh, his microphone is not functioning anymore. So I'm afraid you're stuck with me for the next little while. Let's go to Buffalo Dam, see what we can find there. Maybe that lioness will have given birth. And we'll, well, her cubs will be the size of rats if she has. And she'll be very cross to see us if we go off on foot. That is one thing one though does not want to come across on foot is a lioness with tiny babies in a sort of threatened position in the middle of a drainage line, for example. That can be a very scary experience.
And Jenny Hobbs, yes, I have. You're saying, have I seen a an elephant come through here with a collar on? Yeah, I absolutely have seen an elephant with a cub with a collar coming through. And there is a cow on whom they do quite a lot of research around here. Oh, sorry, one sec. I just want to keep you posted as to whether we find they find them or not. Um. And that elephant, I assume, is part of a project of the Kruger yeah, Park's right. scientific Sorry, services. Yeah, Chris, I've come down, um, the one they haven't found them yet. Um, and like I say, the yeah. Sand Parks or Kruger Park has an enormous division of scientific services. They do research all over the place. I'm not sure how well funded they are anymore. And they certainly do an incredible value, incredibly valuable amount of work. And they would have been intimately involved, for example, in that TB research that we were talking about a little bit earlier. And TB, I mean, TB, I didn't quite finish what I wanted to say there. The TB thing, although that headline, I think, was misleading, the journalism was poor and, I mean, from very eminent uh, publications, uh, TB, we think, we don't really know what it does. And for those of you who don't know, bovine tuberculosis is a form of tuberculosis, which is a bacterial infection of the lungs, which we know. Uh, same thing that humans get, but slightly different. In this case, it affects things like buffalo mainly. It infects kudu, warthog, they also get it. I think impala are immune, but I'm not sure. And we don't actually know what it does. In the same way that a human being, many human beings live with a bacteria in their body and live very, completely full and normal lives, once you get um, or your immune system is compromised, maybe through HIV or maybe through stress or maybe through nutritional deficiencies, then it, the disease starts to take hold. And we think that that is, certainly in my experience, in my observation, that is the case with the lions and the buffalo. The lions get it from eating infected meat. They may well get it from transferring it through each other. And they then, of course, if they get sick or if maybe they have a fight, maybe they're not eating sufficiently, it will then express itself, especially in young lions. That's where I think it really gets to them. And Janet, you want to know if they, some could perhaps be carriers and some could, could perhaps, uh, you know, never show effects. It's possible. It's well possible. Oh, they've gone all the way past Torchwood Camp, everyone. There are now three people looking for them. I feel a great sense of injustice that we couldn't just go across there. But that is the way it is. <laughs> oh, well. So, what I was saying there is I think that you'll find that the youngsters, young lions, say between once they stop suckling so between three and four months up until the age that they're able to actually compete at a kill so that's probably up to 18 months so for that year i think they're at their most vulnerable to tv if they pick it up in that year they're always going to be skinny and nutritionally compromised in that first year or six 18 months of life up to two years and if they're carrying the disease and the pride is not killing sufficiently i think it definitely can take hold but they've been going on, banging on about how TB is going to kill the lions of the Kruger for well, upward of 20 years now. Nothing seems to have changed a great deal. Certainly, in the time that I've been around in the park here for 15 years, I've noticed absolutely no difference. Of course, lion numbers go up and they go down and they go up and they go down. And every time they go down, people go, oh, it must be TB. And they don't do any proper research into it. So I think you'll find that the scientific services dudes at um, Kruger Park would be most put out by that. Most put out by that headline. Kevin, you're in Boston and you want to know about the move, seasonal movement of lions. Kevin, in this area, it's, there's not much seasonal movement. Remember, pride is territorial, and that means that they're going to stick... The pride is territorial, which means that means that they're going to stick to their area. They're never going to wander too far from their own territory unless 
there's a big drought and all the herbivores and prey species move out of their territory, then they might go somewhere else. Uh, but then they become nomadic and they become extremely threatened. In this particular area, because there's water everywhere, it's pumped. We're close to two fairly major rivers. What you'll find is that the lions are almost totally sedentary. They stay within their territory. They don't have seasonal movements at all. That's a nice question. Thank you, Kevin. Now, Kyle, you want to know if pumas or mountain lions are part of the same family as our lions. Yes, they are. They are in the Felidae family. I don't think that they are the same genus, though. So I'm going to ask the final control to look up the genus of the mountain lion. Uh, the, the genus of the big cats out here is Panthera. It's the same as the genus of tigers and of uh, not snow leopards, of jaguars and not there's another, there's another, another cat. I think it is, it is a snow leopard, actually. Snow leopard is also a panthera. It's the cloud leopard that isn't. Um, but I don't think that the New World lions are members of the genus Panthera. I'll get that checked out for you now. But they're definitely the same family in the same way that the house cat is the same family as the lion and the leopard and the tiger and the puma the jaguar, and the cloud leopard, and the bobcat, and the lynx, and the caracal, and the serval. They're all in the same family. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Lots of dust in the air. Yes, thank you very much, Rebecca, for that profound piece of information. We've just told the viewers that the mountain lion is part of the Felidae family. We now want to know its genus. Please, if you wouldn't mind. I should know, but I don't. The genus is Puma. There we go. Genus is Puma. And the species? Might be pushing it here. There we go. It's Puma Concolor. There we go. I remember now. Puma Concolor. So, totally different genus from Panthera. We have two genuses of cat out here. Well, three, if you count the cheetah. We've got, so they're all part of the same family, the Felidae family. And then they split into the genus. We've got the Panthera genus, which includes the lions and the leopards. We've got the Achaeonyx genus, which includes only the cheetah. And then we've got the Felis genus, which contains the caracal, Felis caracal, the African wildcat, Felis libica. The serval, Felis serval, uh, the black-footed cat, and a number of others out here. Now, if you take that sort of division further, you would have the New World cat like, uh, the, like the puma, and that would be puma concolor. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. And also in the panthera, of course, the great tiger, panthera tigris, and the jaguar, which I think is panthera onca, if I'm not mistaken. You don't have to remember any of the Latin. <laughs> the only reason it's interesting, I think, is that it does immediately tell you what's related to what. So, although you might not know the Latin name of, or you might not know the taxonomic designations of many animals, if you've got their Latin name, you know exactly how closely related they are to, you know, other animals that may look similar. So, if you know that the puma is, has a different Latin, different genus, from the lion and the leopard, you know exactly how closely related they are. Good. That was a nice learning experience. Thank you very much. And Debbie, J Debbie, Bachelor, Debbie Bachelor, you say, are there Jaguar in this area? No, there aren't. Jaguar is exclusively a South American uh, animal. It does look very similar to a leopard. It is in the same genus. But if you look at pictures of them next to each other, you can see a jaguar is bigger, uh, I think, than all the subspecies of leopard. The jaguar is larger. It also has wider rosettes. So the leopard spots, which are sort of rosettes of black with a little bit of darker gold in the middle of them, um, jaguars are much bigger than that. 
and it's quite interesting. They do look very similar, but if you ever see a trained leopard in a film, they are most often jaguars because they are much more easy to uh, bring to some form of domestication than leopards are. But they do look very similar. And Eileen, you want to know where the hyena fit into this list. They're in a totally separate family altogether. So we've got the Felidae, that's the family, with all the genus, the gen genii of, of cats. And then the Hyenidae are in a totally different family. And then you'd have the Canidae, which are the dogs, in a totally different family from them. Absolutely not a sausage going on here, is there, Brian? Not at all. Not in the slightest. You know what I think we should do, Brian? What should we do? I think we should issue the, issue the plains of, uh, or the woodlands <laughs> of Juma and head for the plains of Cheetah. Mm. What do you think, Brian? I think so. Yes. <laughs> Apparently Samuel is not yet at camp to fix his microphone, so we can't go to Cheetah Plains just yet. He may have... maybe he's in, stuck in first gear. <laughs> well, he is from Cape Town. <laughs> Leopold, you're worried about the dental hygiene. Of, uh, what am I doing? Hang on a second. We've got to look where that lioness was first before we leave here. Leopold, do you want to know about the dental hygiene of the carnivores in this area? Well, mine... Hold on. Let's have an inspection. I think I might just go and check your own. Yeah, pretty good, huh? Yes. Thank you. My uh, dental hygiene is not too bad, and I'm relatively carnivorous. Leopold, I know that's not what you meant. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. You were subjected to a close-up of my front teeth. <laughs> lucky I didn't punch it. <laughs> yes, I'm very lucky. I suddenly thought I'm not sure everything's out there. Um, sorry, quickly, Brian. Ducks. Isn't that nice? There's a spurwing geese, everyone. Wow! That is so cool. Spurwing geese, let me just move a little bit forward. No, they're turning. They're going to come down. No, they're not. <clears throat> They've obviously come straight out of the Kruger. They are migratory. Maybe they're going away now. They're not going very closely to the north. Let's just go a little bit around the corner here. There, now they've turned north. That's OK. They're quite far. There they go. Isn't that nice? Punch zoom. Spurwing geese on the turn. Marvellous. Huh. Uh, Leopold, back to your uh, question of dental hygiene in the carnivores. Um, carnivores out here, of course, have got very powerful enzymes in the saliva and in the belly, and that kind of keeps everything clean. I think you'll find that the dental issues that our domestic animals have, have a lot to do with the unnatural diet that they have. And that's probably why they have issues. Out here, of course, I mean, the animals have evolved not to have uh, fluoride toothpastes and various other things to help them keep clean. So there doesn't, I very, very seldom have I seen a, a wild animal out here with bad teeth. There is that one elephant, of course, that has that recurved tusk. And they call her Fang. I think this is where the lion was yesterday, isn't it, Brian? Yes, I'm going to say it is, given the tracks going down there. I just thought we'd just stick our noses in here and have a look. But she wasn't here yesterday evening, so I'm not going to drive in there. Yeah, 
Just listening carefully and see if we can hear an alarming animal. Hello, Roy from Missouri. Lovely to have you with us. You're a new viewer. Just one second. Sorry, Chris, confirm you have located. Oh, they found her. <laughs> Clever Queen has caught herself a diker for breakfast and got the two cubs with her. Copy that. Well done. Enjoy it. I, of course, said that very politely to him, feeling nothing but a sense of great jealousy and resentment. Right, um, Roy, you want to know about white tigers and white lions and whether they are inbred or if there is a naturally occurring gene that makes these tigers and lions white. Uh, there is a naturally occurring gene in this very area which causes uh, what we call leukism, and that leukism is a is a, a whitening of an animal and the most the, the the best example of that is if you think of a domestic pigeon go outside and find a domestic pigeon the, those white ones which are not albino but they're white they are leukistic and it's the same thing with the lions that are slightly paler i mean they are pretty much white but they're not albino so that does occur here it does occur with the tigers in the same way but when you say describe inbreeding, absolutely, you'll find that um, so people will capture lions like that or capture tigers, and they have in the past. They breed them for circuses, they breed them for exotic farms, they breed them for hunting even. And so, yes, there's a huge, huge amount of inbreeding with white lions and white tigers outside of wild populations. They, it's an extremely rare gene, so when it does occur in the wild, it's, uh, it's perfectly natural, but it's very unusual. And so the number of white lions and white tigers that are found sort of in captivity far, far exceeds the number that would occur naturally in the wild. And because of that, you can be very sure those animals are completely inbred because the, the genes just don't exist for the same numbers to occur in the wild. Thank you very much for that, Roy. It's lovely to have you with us, and I hope we manage to find you an actual lion to look at today. And Robin in the Bahamas, how lovely to hear from you. I want to go to the Bahamas desperately. Brian, wouldn't it be nice to go to the Bahamas? Chill to the max on the beach there. Mm, perhaps a pina colada or two. Uh, you said, Robin, you want to know if we get black leopards here in South Africa? We do. Not commonly, though. Very uncommonly. There have been records of black leopards found around a place called Leidenberg, or now Mashing Shing, and that is up on the High Felt. Anywhere where there's a forested area, leopards will occur, and the chances of having a black or um, melanistic leopard are that much higher. Much more common, though, as we go north into Africa, and the Central African rainforests uh, will definitely kind of um, uh, nearly use the word inspire, but they would, uh, it, they would be conducive to having a black leopard. There was once a rumor of one in the Sabi sands, I don't believe it to be true. I'm sure it was a domestic dog that went running across someone's vision sometime during the night. There have been elephants here. Leopold, you're on fire this morning. You say you'd like to know, would I be okay with cloning an animal in order to increase populations, or would I think it was unethical? Um, Leopold, if we got to the stage where we were about to, uh, animals were about to become extinct, then I would certainly consider it. Would I suggest they get put into a wild situation? Absolutely not. Do I think it's ethical or unethical? Well, I think that depends very much on your own bent of ethics. Uh, uh, cloning an animal for the sake of it. I, you know, from my, off the top of my head, thought on this is that 
you know, it's there's a massive, massive amount of money spent on things like cloning and on, um, I mean, even if we take the, the rhino poaching debacle that uh, is going on in South Africa, there are an immense, immense amount of money paid to various things that I think it could be more effectively spent on. So in the case of cloning an animal, I'd much as the elephant, I'd much rather um, clone, I'd, I'd much rather spend the money increasing uh, awareness or increasing space where animals can live and protecting those spaces. So I think that would be more valuable than cloning an animal. Remember, once you clone an animal, it is genetically identical to the animal from which you've cloned it. There are some elephants up ahead. Wonderful. They're unfortunately just like the leopard crossing next door. But we'll get a quick view. And so cloning an animal takes away from the genetic pool. And you could never sort of, or be very difficult to save a species from a clone because you would immediately narrow the genetic pool or make it so shallow that it would be, it would be unviable. Oh, don't go into Biffle's Hook. Look at them all. We're just going to get bottoms here. Lots of elephant bottoms. Look at that, Brian. Sunday morning elephant bottoms. Oh well, at least we do believe that there are some elephants now. I'm getting some very astute and difficult questions to answer this morning, which are the best kinds of questions. Jody, you say we're always talking about how elephants flap their ears to keep cool. How on earth do they keep warm? Well, Jody, we go into the interesting discussion of size here and the mass-specific metabolic rate. Now, you don't need to remember that. All you need to remember is that a big animal, and you can see elephants don't have fur on them, gains heat slowly, but once the heat is in the animal, it doesn't lose it very quickly. So the bigger you are, the harder it is for you to lose heat. And so an elephant like that probably hardly has to warm up. It does take a lot of energy to make it warm, but once it's warm, it finds it very difficult to lose that heat. So the opposite case, of course, would be something like that bushveld gerbil we saw last night. And that bushveld gerbil will lose heat very quickly and become very cold very quickly. There you can see the clouds breaking up a little bit. So basically, the simple answer is that a, an elephant is very large and therefore will lose heat very slowly. And I mean, I can draw you a graph of how this all works if you like. And uh, if I become so desperate by the lack of animals that uh, it comes to that, I'll draw you a graph. But I think let's rather go and look for some animals first. Last resort. Last, very last resort. Draw a graph in the sand. Now, Gary, a very commonly asked question, but one that I'm going to give a slightly different answer to today. You say, can domestic dogs and wild dogs breed together? The answer is no, they can't. Um, and they would have if they could. But what is interesting, and I don't know the reasons for this, and I've only read it on a fairly sort of, um, well, not dubious, but a less than, less than peer-reviewed website. Um, wild dogs do not come from the same genus as domestic dogs. Okay? So we had that discussion about where that makes them fit in relative to other dogs. So the, fa the family is the canidae, or the dogs, and that is split into a number of different genuses into which the wild dogs are, they're the only species in their genus, which is Lycaon. And then we have the genus of Canis. And into that genus, we have the wolves, Canis lupus. We have the two jackals that we get here, Canis mesomelis, the black-backed, and Canis, uh, whatever it is, the side-striped, I don't remember what that one is. We also have the domestic dog, Canis probably domesticus at this stage. 
four of them within the same genus. But some recent genetic research seems to have shown, and I say this is not, this is not gospel by any stretch, seems to show that the wild dog is actually more closely related to a domestic dog and to therefore to the wolf than it is to the, than the, yeah, than, than any of them are to uh, jackals, which form the same genus. Now, I'm not sure how that works or why that works, but that seems to be the case. That said, they are not able to interbreed with each other. All right, we're now on the eastern boundary again. We're going to try and head to Cheetah Plains, depending on whether or not Sam Wise is mobile. Elaine Bowl, another great example. We've got the Bovidae family into which buffalo and cattle both fit. They're different genuses, so no, they cannot interbreed. But they're closely enough related, I think, for them to be used as surrogates for one another. I think you can use a a Jersey cow, look at those two little chaps trying to stay warm there. Sorry, Brian, just over there. Two Stienbock. <laughs> so what I should have done there, everybody, is point for Brian before I stopped the car. Because I knew when I stopped, or I should have known when I stopped, that there's little Stienbock, two females. So probably a little ewe and her soon-to-be independent lamb. Uh, they've gone scuttling off into the bushes. Sorry about that, Brian. Okay, good. Glad you've forgiven me. Um, I think you can use a Jersey cow, for example, as a surrogate for a, a buffalo calf. I'm not 100% sure, but I think you can. You can certainly use a Jersey cow as an adoptive mother for a buffalo. They will, they will suckle buffalo and the buffalo grow very fast indeed. So lots of very closely related animals, of course, to our domestic ones, but not the same. And it's quite interesting because there isn't, a, there isn't an example of animal domestication in Africa. So the zebras, the buffalo, the wild dogs, the jackals have never been domesticated. The wolf, of course, the domestic wolf comes from, I'm talking rubbish there, sorry, the domestic cat comes from Egypt. And that's an African wild cat. It's a domesticated version of that wild animal. The, all our, every single domestic dog, from the lamentable Chihuahua up to the magnificent Irish Wolfhound, they all come from wolves, way down back in the distant past. And so that you can see how closely related they must be. In the same way, the cattle come from something called an auroch, which was found in um, the Fertile Crescent around sort of the Middle East. But so the auroch was probably even close, more closely related to the buffalo than domestic cattle are, but as the centuries have gone on, so that split has widened. And the same goes for just about any domestic animal that you can find. None of them domesticated here. So while there are many, many examples of animals in Africa that are very similar to domestic animals, very few of them could ever actually interbreed with African animals because they have been separated. None of the domestic animals that we know come from Africa. Chickens come, chickens were domesticated twice, in different sources. What else have we got? Goats? I don't know where goats came from. Horses from Asia. Kitty cat, you say, do we have Bontobok here? No, we don't. Bontobok, everybody, is a very beautiful antelope, quite similar to a blessbok, which might be found here. Um, I'm going to show you a picture. Oh. I mean, we're almost drawing the graph stage, given, given the lack of animals that I'm finding you at the moment. But the Bontobok is a relative of the Blessbok, which is not found here. And Kitty Cat, they are about seven times the size of a Stienbok. You want to know they're the same size as a Stienbok? No, they're much, much bigger. There's a little Stienboki. Stienboki is one foot at the shoulder, 35 centimeters, just over one foot. That isn't a Stienbock, is it? Here's the Stienbock. <laughs> There's the Stienbock. 
so embarrassing. I thought it was a bit short. A steam hawk is one and a half feet at the shoulder. <laughs> ah, let's go and find the Bonte book. There's the Bonte book. Or the blessed book. They are just over four feet, almost four feet at the shoulder. And that really is a blessed book or Bonte book. Only found in the southwestern Cape is the Bonte book. Blessed book all over the high felt. But the Bonte book, which is a subspecies of the blessed book, only found in the southwestern cape. <laughs> right, and there's a lion. Do you see the lion there, oh, Brian? I do. I thought so. That's a lion. Very nice. It's a very nice horned lion, melanistic version. And this here is um, a marula tree. You can tell by the ring. Right? You can tell by the ring it's a marula tree. Okay, there we go. Sam is back on, on line, and he has, he's got one of these to show you. So, we haven't seen each other for quite some time. What happened was the mic on my microphone dewired and we had to get from Arethusa back to camp and get that wiring done. So we are back in action and we were with a buffalo bull that is on his own out here. He's looking very skittish, very, very nerf nervous out here. And we're not too sure why. Look at the, the way he's behaving. He's smelling us. There's, he's also got a nice piece of grass in his mouth there, so he looks quite nervous, but at the same time he looks quite relaxed, as if he's... <laughs> but no, that man is not in a good mood. He's staring straight at us, so he's, he's nervous of our, of our pre presence. I think the night was very unsettling for most animals out there. There's been, there's loads of hyena tracks that are on Gallagher Shortcut, which is the road we are on now. So it could have been hyenas that have unsettled this bull. He's smelling there and he's not looking happy. We're going to leave him, let him be. And we are going to carry on. Yeah, so we missed you. We got back to camp as quick as possible. We were dodging Shonga Lolos, which are little millipedes on the road as best we could, all the way back so that we can get the wiring fixed. So on Galago and around this area is where we often find the hyenas. The hyena den is not far away, so we're going to pop into the hyena den. Oh, that... Rebecca just reminded me that I need to collect some worms for Buffy. I do need to do that. I literally was just with Buffy, so it was actually super good that I went back. Is that a, red, is that a yellow bull oxpecker? Oh, my word, everyone. It's a new bird to the list. What a feeling. Look at that yellow bull oxpecker. So we have a secretary bird and a yellow bull oxpecker and a beautiful looking kudu, young male kudu, you can see the horns. But that is an exciting moment for me because I finally can tick the yellow build or oxpecker. That's very cool. Let's see if we can get one more shot. You can just see his beak just over that crest there. There we go, look at the yellow bill. So not as common as the red build oxpecker. And interestingly, they have two different ways in which they collect the ticks off animals. They said that I think it was the red-billed oxpecker will pick the ticks off, and the yellow-billed will scissor the ticks out. So scissor and pick. Interesting that they have two different methods, two different colours for two different methods. That was the two birds this morning: a secondary bird and a yellow-billed oxpecker. Put that on your list. That must be number. 26, 27 for me. So I write this all down at the end of drive so I don't have to bore you with writing. I can write quite slowly. So everyone has these comments that people from Cape Town are slow and they move slowly. You know, my comment to that and James is that we, we take in the detail. You know, we have a look for the details that, that most people miss. 
So in drawing the bird and writing the bird, looking at it, you learn a little bit more. But what I was just going to say now, before we saw that bird, is that I went back to the cam ops room. Of course, we had to fix the mic. And I went and had a look at Buffy. And he had just gone to the toilet. So he's using, well, gone to the toilet in his own, um, in his own box. So I just cleaned that up and just made, made sure that he was feeling better. At least, I think he was feeling better. But he was chirping, he was squawking, if that's a word, he was squawking. Ooh, elephant. I didn't come in here too quietly, so they're definitely nervous of my presence. But no, they're not. They're eating, they're great. They are eating some grass this morning. There we go, you can see that one is collecting some, ooh, listen to the sound of that. So this could be the very same breeding herd that we heard earlier. We heard and saw, so we saw a breeding herd earlier, but I also heard one that was coming from this direction. Swelling us. You listen to that sound of the Ellie as he rips the branches, collects his leaves, strips the grass out of the out of the ground. How cool that was that sighting when we saw two different breeding herds of elephants come into Sydney's dam yesterday. That was so cool. So this this could be the same, one of those breeding herds that were running in to Sydney's dam, where we also saw the water buck. So the, the wind is still quite strong. I think that the Ellies are quite enjoying this weather. It's not too hot. They can spend most of the day looking for food. I think this could be the breeding herd with that really small youngster. Let's see if I can get a little bit closer this way. Sorry, my head's getting in the way there. V2, I'm so glad that Safari Live has influenced your way of seeing. That's really, really good. You watched ants at their mound yesterday. It's so interesting to see how ants work in their little colonies underground. I get the different worker ants, the protector soldier ants. The social structure of ants are incredible. But have a look at this elephant just feeding right next to us, so comfortable in our presence as it eats. how they can wrap those trunks around grass. There we go, grass, smacking all the dirt out of it and then putting it in their mouth and then stripping this, what seems to be a variable bush wallow, stripping those leaves off the tree. I love to just look at even the skin of elephants. 
I have such magnificent looking skin. Look at that. And their ears are so large, which on a hot day, look, that one's got a bit of a hole in the ear. So potentially, maybe, that was because of a thorn. Or a little scruffle it might have had when it was a youngster. You can see the tail quite, quite prominently on the back of that elephant. And that will whip left to right to get all the flies away from it. Great filming from VM. You can see the other elephants that are in the background there. So it's quite a quite a large breeding herd. Number of females in their in their calves. Let's see if I can get to a nice position. Mr. Ellie wants to join the party. There's Mr. Ellie. He wants to join the breeding herd. I don't know if you can join the breeding herd just yet. Take some notes. Oh, it's feeding. This is very cool. It's suckling. Look at the youngster suckling. There we go. How special is this to watch a young elephant suckling from its mother? Very cool. You can quite easily see the nipple there. Awesome. It's very cool to see that right up close. And we've also just spotted the other youngster, which is there. So there are quite a few young ones here. I think this could be the very youngster that's been running around, jumping in the water for us, falling down in the water, getting up to mischief with his brothers and sisters. This one here is playing. Just got a little bit nervous of us, started to smell us out. Cool to be sitting right next to an elephant as it suckles from its mother. And then has a little something to eat. So when you're out in the bush and you hear the sound that you are listening to now, is the sound of twigs breaking and cracking. Be aware that there are some large, large animals around. What's this one doing over here? Looks like a little knob thorn tree. Yeah. <laughs> I think he really likes it. I mean, there's so many bushes around it. I know that the elephant really likes to eat the acacia, flaky thorn acacia. So we never see them grow that big. Gina Dobson is asking, are there any pine trees that are around this area? No, Gina, I haven't seen any pine trees since I've been here. None at all. Have you seen any of them? Pine trees. Uh, if they do occur here, that means they were brought here. They're not indigenous to this part of the bush. Like an easy view, they've got the plantations. Yeah. 
So Hazy View is a, is a town that's quite close by, and they have big plantations of pine, but it's not naturally occurring. The pine plants that, wow, that was cool. See that crack down that little bush willow over there? So pines aren't indigenous, and they're actually quite bad for the ecology around South Africa because they monopolize all the water resources. Same with the gum trees. I'm just trying to remember what the scientific name of the gum tree was. Eucalyptus, I think it is. Eucalyptus trees, which we often find in Australia. And the pine trees can be a bit of a problem on the South African soil. The main problem with the pine tree is that the needles of the needles of the pine tree are very acidic so when they fall to the ground it actually makes the soil acidic which then doesn't allow other species of plants to grow around it so it decreases the biodiversity in an area quite substantially from plant life to bird life to insect life It's so cool that this breeding herd is feeling very comfortable around us as it browses. There we go, getting the trunk around the branch. And then he's going to strip it, stripped. Such innovation that is coming out of the trunk of an elephant. Many things within human science is now developing ways in which we can learn from a trunk. So biomimicry. Coming back to biomimicry, there's a whole bunch of robotics that are being designed so that we may have systems that work similar to that of a trunk. So there's loads you can learn from that design. We've got a really nice picture now of that ear. It's almost the size of its head. And all the capillary veins are in there, so you can kind of make out the veins in the ear. It's a beautiful shot of that elephant. And that any will flap its ears when it gets very hot out here. And it'll take wind to all those little capillaries but that that will then cool this elephant down on a very hot day Angie in Wisconsin is saying, have you ever noticed the inside of the trunk? It almost looks like an octopus, you know, on the legs of an octopus. If that's right, the tentacles of an octopus. I haven't noticed that, Angie. This could be the moment that I notice that. Let's see what we can see with, with this female. Let's see over here. There we go. We've got the trunk right there. There is, there is the trunk. There he is now. Ooh, it's moving a lot. There's large female elephant. You can see her memory just beneath her stomach there, the top of her stomach. And the female elephant has a quite a large part of the top of her head. There's a sharp over there to see the female. Here we can see it. Oh, the ass is now crossing the road. That was very interesting behavior. What was that?
question from Leopold is, do elephants have to fear anything in their day, during their day-to-day -day life? Well, Leopold, we do have a few predators that would, that would not be shy in taking down a young elephant calf if the mother's not protecting it. So it does have to be aware of a few male lions it's going to be silent here as we sit with this elephant. displayed by this elephant next to us. It's a little bit confused, interested in what we are. But we just must remain still and calm. And that's how you deal with elephants when you are surrounding them. It's important to just listen to what they're doing and how they are acting. There's one feeding just behind this tree behind us now. You can see his eye. That was a very, very, very cool sighting. So, just going to finish that question on some of the dangers of day-to-day -day life. They need to be aware of predators such as male lions. If there's a coalition of four or more, they wouldn't be scared to take down a young calf. If it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it can happen. So they do need to be aware of some of those predators. But they don't have many, many things to fear, much like all the other animals, Archer. I think their biggest fear can be the sun during the drought. That's what would be the biggest fear. So, I was just wondering, if Mr. Ellie over here is a female or a male. What do you guys think? I think that's got a, got a big dome on the head there. So this is actually, Elvis can give us um, quite a nice little example. The dome on the top of the head here will tell you if it's a female, if it's pronounced archer. And if it's rounded on top, it's most likely a male. But of course, if looking at the genitalia from the mammary glands to the head, and the genitalia will tell you the difference. So that is that. We're going to leave this breeding herd now. I'm just, just going to see what the... So, ooh, still got some elephants coming up in the front of us here. So we are not going anywhere. Brian B would like to know how long do elephants live for? Well, Brian B, they can live up to 40 years. All the way up to 40 years. That's the, the kind of average longevity of an elephant. What a special sighting, watching them as they behaved between each other. We saw a little bit of aggressive behavior. We saw some a young suckling from its mother. And they came right close by our vehicle. Very cool. How cool was that sighting? I really enjoyed that. Too bad Elvis couldn't get involved. He's gonna stick on my vehicle. 
Von Tan Bing. So they're just going to head into the. Okay, so they're just going to head into that thicket now, most likely browse and graze for the rest of the day. And if they feel like going to the watering holes, we might see them at Sydney's a bit later. Otherwise, James is on cheetah plants. Let's go and see how James is doing. We are on cheetah plains, everybody. News from this end of the world is that the wild dogs have come through here. Unfortunately, they're not in our current traversing area. This tree here. I don't know what it is. Just let me quickly have a look, if you don't mind, everyone. I don't mean to give, you know, in the absence of anything else. Let me quickly have a look. It's a camifera. It's a camifera tree. Just smell it, Brian. Tell me what you smell. Shut up. Citrusy? Did you get any citrus? Yeah, almost. Yeah. It's a yeah, it's a camifera. I don't know which one, and the leaves are all an odd size because it is a little tree, and so it's desperately trying to gather as much sunlight as it can. But that's what that is, a camifera or cork wood. And the interesting thing about that tree is that it is, occurs throughout Africa and the Middle East. And we all know the story of the three wise men and their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Well, myrrh is made from a camifera tree. It's a really nice smell. So nice. Sort of like a sweet citrusy smell. Mmm. I'm just, I'm going to leave this radio on. I know it's a little bit irritating, but um, because the signal's not great. But I just want to find out where these dogs are going to go because they might cross our southern boundary and go on to Vuyatela or Juma. So we'll just keep a listen, listening. Ooh. Hello, Matthew Hamilton. What a lovely question from you. Matthew, you want to know if I think wild animals can get diabetes? It's a very old male leopard track. Matthew, uh, no, I don't believe they can. Yes, I know domestic dogs can get diabetes. Domestic animals and human beings get diabetes because we don't eat what we're designed to eat. It's, it's really that simple. Unless you're genetically predisposed to type 1 diabetes, the scourge of type 2 or lifestyle diabetes is born purely of the fact that we eat so much refined carbohydrate and sugar. It's got nothing to do with any sort of disability in the human form. And the same goes for domestic animals. Now out here, a lion and a leopard and a buffalo and even a small red-billed buffalo weaver does not eat refined carbohydrates. They don't eat what they're not designed to do, and so they don't have pancreas failure. Diabetes occurs when your pancreas has been exerted, overused to such an extent that it can no longer produce insulin. And that only happens when you stress it so, out so much that it eventually throws its hands up and says, that's it, I'm done. And that occurs when we eat these vast, vast amounts of refined sugars and carbohydrates. A cold drink, sports drinks, you know, 12 or 13 teaspoons of sugar in a can of Coca-Cola, however many else in a can of Gatorade or what we call Energade out here, all of which are sold to us, um, you know, through some very, very clever marketing. So the sugar lobby, which has tried and continues to convince us that sugar is good for us, has uh, contributed massively to diabetes, and that's why it doesn't occur in the wild. 
You will not find a wild animal that has diabetes with a pancreas that has given up. Very nice question, that. Thank you. It's one of my favorite bugbears, that. And Robin, while you want to know how an animal becomes domesticated, uh, I'm just quickly, uh, sorry, every, every so often I'm just going to cast my attention to the radio because we may need to turn around. Um, Robin, an animal becomes domesticated through a process of selective breeding. So let's take the domestic dog as the best example. Somebody would have eventually or would have found a wolf puppy that was either abandoned by its mother or they would have killed its mother. I'm not sure what it would have been. And then they would have raised that puppy by hand. And this would have happened a number of times. And what would then have happened is that they would have taken the most tame of those puppies. Because if you just take a wolf pup out of the wild and you raise it by hand, it will certainly be less... There's a basilia coming off the ground there. You see there, Brian? It's just come off the ground. Trying desperately to take off. Well done. It's been eating something on the ground there. We'll go and have a look what that was. A juvenile bachelier. Look how it flies. Oh, and now it turns into the wind and gains height. Isn't that amazing? Very difficult to balance the processes going on in that bachelier's brain, the unconscious processes to make it stable in a gusting wind like this are absolutely astonishing. You can see how the wind tips it and it makes slight adjustments to the areons, to the wings, to wing tips. That's just brilliant. The tail twitching, twitching from side to side. Up it goes. Hmm, brilliant. Very nice. We'll just go and see what he was eating on the ground there. So let's just go back to the domestic dog scene. Oof, look at that cloud. Vicious, vicious cloud. Might have to take another brilliant photograph, right? And I'll take a photograph of it now. Um, Let's just quickly stop and see if, we'll see if we can't see what this batelier was eating. So you take the domestic dog, you take the two wolf pack, the two wolf pups. If you raise one, it will be vicious uh, or more vicious. But every so often, you'll get a tamer one than others. We all know that animals have different temperaments, and so if you take a tame wolf pup or a, a less angry wolf wolf, and you mate it with a, uh, an equally less angry one, their pups will be even less angry and they will be more domesticated and this happens over a process of many generations until you've got an animal like a domestic dog now which is has been selectively bred for its calmness and the same goes for the domestication of many other species here is what it's been eating what is that Eww, something died here and distressingly it looks to me like the fur of a side striped jackal. I might be quite wrong. Let me have a look. Let me bring you a piece of this. I don't want to hold it with me hands. Brian, what do you think? I'm not too sure. I hope it's not a wild dog. I think this is a jackal. Yeah, here's the white tail tip. Or, you know, it could be. Is a white-tailed mongoose. Uh, yes. Coloration looks right. 
Yeah. I think that's what it is. I think a white-tailed mongoose got hit last night, possibly by some jackals or even by a leopard. A leopard will easily kill a white-tailed mongoose and consume it. So I think that's what that is. White-tailed mongoose. Yeah. Hmm? Do you think we should keep it? Where do you want to put it? You mean like Sam's elephant? This is a bit macabre, don't you think? We'll put it here. We'll put it in our, uh, in our light. <laughs> now let me quickly take a picture. World's greatest landscape photographer at work, everybody. I hope you feel as honoured as Brian does. Brian, please describe the sense of honour you feel right now. You're in awe at my skill, aren't you? Right, everybody, I'm going to show it to you now, once I have told this very clever program how to fix it. Zoop! <laughs> it's amazing. Zoop! Zoop! Oh, yours is not going to come close to this, what my <laughs> incredible phone app has managed to do. Wait, it's almost there, everybody. One more small adjustment. Ding! Ding! Let's zoom in a bit. Ding. Oh, it's going to be beautiful, Brian. You're going to be so amazed when you see what I have produced here. <laughs> are you actually watching me do it, are you? Okay. There we go. There we go. Can you even see it? Not really. I will post this, everyone. It's a very stunning photograph that I've taken. Kathy, you say that we need to attach this, the, that thing, the tail to the aerial. Yes, we might do that a little bit later. But for now, it's going to remain there, where it can smell in peace. Very nice, Brian. Absolute geniuses of the wild, we are. Here we, here we go. Put my blankie over my knees. Very cold. Sorry, James Richard, I think I missed your question there. You want to know, uh, you said you thought dogs were domesticated from what? Oh, donkeys were domesticated from the African wild ass. I didn't think they had been. I might be wrong. It's well possible, James. The African wild ass, of course, of course occurs up, I think, on the ho in the Horn of Africa. But you might be right, James. And James is saying that because I said that not, no animals have been domesticated here because they're a bit nasty, they're a bit aggressive. But that may well be one of them. Now, what I wanted to show you about him before he got up and walked off was his blackened eyes and hard face. And I, you know, I haven't noticed this before this year. And it's just, and that's my lack of observation. It's not any change. But these impala are fighting with each other. And the rams are looking beaten up now. If you look at this guy's face, if you'll deign to turn to us, you can see his eyes are, I don't know, they, they look like black eyes. The skin has been removed from underneath them. And that's from fighting. There, you can see him chasing the others around. And it is no coincidence that so many of the kills we've seen of late have been male impala hanging from trees. Ah. 
Okay. So thank you, James, for that. You have confirmed that the donkey is born of the African wild ass. Thank you very much for that. Here is a hornbill feeding off a buffalo's aging bleached bones. See that? You look like he's going to be sick, I'm not surprised. I suspect that there are termites on the ground here and that's why the hornbill is knocking about here. I'm not sure why he's trying to bite that, bite that piece of leaf. They always look so either surprised or kind of um, jauntily cheeky, as if to, they're challenging you. And what do you want here? What do you want here? Hmm? What do you want? There he is. Right, we're going to head into the Great Plains of Cheetah now. With no doubt, Brian, there'll be ostriches, cheetah, jackals, Mm, Birmingham boys, all sorts of things, don't you think? think so. Yes. Probably wildebeest, being eaten by all the others, except maybe the ostrich. Or maybe the ostrich. Ta da! View. Not much. Not much. We'll keep looking, everyone, don't worry. We will bravely go where many have gone before. Um, I have noticed a few times on here getting a message from Judy H about my blankie. Judy, sorry, go with that again, uh, Rebega. Oh, Rebe Judy H, you want to know if this blankie is my family tartan? No, no, no. My family tartan, Judy H, is very red. This is a, this was bought from some thrift shop somewhere in Hoodsprate. It is the tartan of nothing in particular. Um, there are many community nest spider webs here on Cheetah Plains, and I know Sam has stopped at a few of them. And I kept thinking he was stopping at the same one. But there are a number of really enormous ones here. And I don't know why that should be the case compared with at Juma. Gosh, this is a foul wind. Is it not, Brian? It's very foul. Heaving into our faces from the southeast. There's a giraffe, Brian. Yes! Alright, Janita, you've got a very good question as we drive into this driving wind. You want to know if any part of the Kruger National Park uses wind power. Are we able to find sufficient uh, wind in the Kruger for turbines? We are not. Nowhere is there sufficient wind, I'm afraid, in the Kruger Park for turbines. There are very few places in South Africa, in fact. Well, I mean, they're on the Cape. You could have wind turbines. Cape Town is a wonderful example of somewhere that should basically be a wind farm. But not the Kruger, no. It's generally very still in these parts. He's a lovely old bull, that fellow. Luke, as we sit here in a very large clearing, you want to know if there is any danger ever 
of there being fires that could threaten us out here. Luke, yes, sometimes. Um, the, well, basically the answer is that when we've had a good rainy season, what happens is the grass gets very long. Let me just reverse a bit so that Brian can get a proper look. Is that all right, Brian? Just seem to be trying to get out of frame, rather. Um, Luke, after a very good rainy season, the grass grows tall and long. And then during the dry season, it turns golden brown and it becomes very dry. And then as the next rainy season approaches, when September and October come, ever, the vegetation is extremely dry and there is a lot of lightning. And that is when natural wildfires can occur. And so when you've had a good rainy season, you need to make sure that any sort of human habitation is surrounded by what we call fire breaks or areas where the vegetation has already been burned or cut very short, like in this clearing. There's no ways a wildfire could ever get through this clearing that this giraffe is walking through. Uh, you could walk up to it and stamp it out, no matter how hard the wind was blowing. That's just because there simply isn't enough fuel load. And there's not enough fuel load here, A, because it's a soda clearing, and B, because we don't have, um, we, we just haven't had enough rain for there to be long grass. So there goes Mr. Giraffe into Cheetah Plains, which is excellent news. And nature is beautiful. You wanted a giraffe earlier. Well, there you are. I do what I can for you. Nature is beautiful. It's very sedately walking into the trees, I think, to get away from this driving bitter wind. This is a little bitter, isn't it, Brian? Yes, so bitter. I'm a, you want to know when giraffe mating season is. I've just taken another world-class photograph, everybody. I have to show you this. Giraffes don't have a specific mating season, Ima. They've got a very kind of, uh, they're aseasonal breeders, which means that they can breed any time of year. But there will be a peak probably during the springtime. So there'll be a peak during the spring. This is astonishing, Brian. I, I mean, my genius knows is boundless. It is unbelievable, isn't it? I took it through the binoculars, of course. Can you even see it? I might have that framed. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite cool. Okay, everyone, let's, let's carry on from here. We're going to go off to the e far east, just see if we can't see something there. I've got nothing specific in plan. Sandy. Um, sorry, every time I cover my ear, I'm just covering the wind so that I can hear the questions coming through from Final Control. Sandy, you you say, is there, uh, you've seen uh, footage obviously of giraffe fighting off lions with their front feet. You want to know if their front feet are powerful enough for them to do some serious damage. The answer is absolutely, they are, they've killed lions like that before. And I wonder if you're not thinking of that footage from those, uh, that wonderful new documentary on desert lions where they got that incredible footage of that female being desert lion chasing a giraffe and she leaps onto the giraffe and the giraffe manages to throw her off and then stamps. You can see her stamping with her back and her front leg at the lion. Uh, but maybe that's what it was. You say you have seen a giraffe female fight or five lions. Yeah, well possible, not unusual. Giraffe are not commonly eaten out here, you know. There is one currently being eaten by our old pals, the Matimbas, on the Londolosi. A giraffe fell over and drowned in a pan. 
in a natural pan, couldn't get out, fell over and it drowned. And now one of the Matimba males is, <laughs> will be eating it for many days. Did you get that, Brian? No. Sorry, you're going to have to try again. Leopold, you're interested in the horns or ossicones of the giraffe and you say what is the purpose of the ossicones or the two handles on the top of the giraffe's skull? The purpose, Leopold, is for defense. They are horns. They are used by the males to fight each other. I'm not sure the, the females use them so much for that. The females may try and use them for defense. I don't know, against predators, although they're much more likely to kick them. Um, I think it's just skull protection, Leopold. Uh, again, in mean, the females, it's unusual. I'm surprised. Yeah, good question. I don't know why they would have them, but the males definitely use them for fighting. Maybe the females fight a bit amongst themselves as well. Elaine, you want to know if giraffes hurt their legs very often because they're so long. No, I, I don't think they do, but they, what they do is that they do fall over quite often. They're not that balanced, which means that if lions want to try and kill them or hyenas want to kill them, if they chase them down a steep slope or over some rocky ground, often the giraffe will fall over. And if a giraffe falls over and its neck get, falls onto the ground, it's very, very difficult for it to right itself and sit up. So you'll see when giraffes lie down, they just fold their legs underneath them. They don't ever put their heads all the way down. Very difficult for them to right themselves unless they're on completely flat ground. And so it is a good idea for lions if you want to eat a giraffe to chase it across some rocky ground or over a steep slope. Apparently Sam is looking for wild dogs. This is fascinating. I'm going to get an update from him as well. Alright, so we are currently on our way towards our most, it's western, it's our, we're going towards our western border to see if we can get close to the wild dogs that are potentially crossing in to our property, which would be awesome. So we're just heading there and there's so many vehicles that are going on at the moment. There must have been about six different vehicles trying to view the wild dogs, but uh, quite a few of them cannot go onto our property. So as soon as they head onto our property, we'll have a very cool sighting of those wild dogs. Potentially they may be hunting, moving around quickly, which will be fun. But from what I've heard, you've been putting things like uh, a tail. What was James doing? Was James putting a tail on his mantelpiece? And uh, it's quite strange. Does it look good? I mean, does it look nice on his car? Does it look better than my Ellie sits on this car? I can't imagine it. I don't, I just can't imagine a white-tailed mongoose tail on the front. I mean, how does it even stay there? <laughs> James. Okay, cool. So, we are going I want to let James know what we're doing, because I think he might want to get involved. James Henry, do you copy James? Uh, he doesn't have signal. He doesn't have signal where he is, so I'll just let FC know. Rebecca, it is thought that the wild dogs are going to be heading in from Little Gowrie. So what we are doing, we're going towards our Arethusa boundary and to Triple M, and we're going to see if we can see them come through. Hold on, we've got some ground hornbills. <laughs> I 
don't know why I was talking on the radio there. Because <laughs> they can hear everything that I'm saying. But we just saw some ground hornbills. I don't know if you spotted that. Can you see them there, Vian? So we've got ground hornbills on our bird list. Let's see if we can spot them again. There they are. Wow, look how cool that is. Another big bird for this morning. We've seen a secretary bird. We've seen a ground hornbill. And we've seen a yellow-billed oxpecker. So it's been an exciting morning for birds. And they have such a significant call. If you've heard a, horn, a ground hornbill call, call, it almost sounds like a lion. It's like a lion in the distance. That's what it sounds like. So some people often get that wrong. That was a very cool sighting of the ground hornbill. So just to let everyone know, we're going towards the boundary road. Just listening to this message. So they think that the dogs have crossed, so we're going to try and get our way to Impala Road as quick as possible, which we are now, which will take us to our boundary. Hopefully, we've got some dwarf mongoose. Have a look at these dwarf. Very cool little dwarf mongoose. Hello, friend. Be careful out there. There are eagles that will very happily eat you. So maybe go and find some shelter or not. Do whatever makes you happy. Get some food. In the meantime, we're going to go see if we can find some wild dogs. Okay, so we're on our boundary. This is our boundary with Arethusa that's right here. These wild dogs could come at any moment. They're a very exciting animal to watch, especially in the vehicle. I've only had it once with them, and it was quite nerve-wracking. I was very new. It was only like the second week I'd been here. And the radio goes crazy, so I've got a whole bunch of different radio comms that are going through my ear in terms of what they're doing and how they're doing it. And then trying to deal with wild dogs chasing in Nyala through our Mugwati drainage line. It's definitely the biggest test that I've had here at Juma, but I managed to get through it, which is cool. Okay, so we've got some vehicles ahead. That's a good sign. Essentially, they've crossed. on our right here. This is little Gauri on our right. We're heading east now. We're actually going to turn around. We're going to turn around. So we're coming on to our triple M boundary. So let's just turn around and get there. Because now we're basically driving towards James. I don't know if I want to see James right now. I want to see a wild dog. It's definitely one of the most nerve-wracking things I had coming out to the bush was not driving on other people's property, not driving onto Marla Marla, not driving onto Coral. Because landowners don't get very happy when you drive on their land. So we've got to make sure that we stick to our places and respect other people's properties. So that means a lot of learning of maps. So on this bird list book also I have is my map book that teaches me all the different roads that are out here. And as, as I started working here, we got Cheetah Plains. So it was Arethusa, Juma, and then Cheetah Plains, all the different networks of roads to learn. It's actually been a load of fun. It's, it's so fun to just explore land and figure it all out. Enjoy being an adventurer. So we've got to look 
everywhere to see if we can find those painted wolves. Anna Marie says that little Ellie helps us find very cool sightings. I can only agree with you. We've seen very interesting sightings over the last couple of days, really. Especially those hyenas the other day that were fighting. I don't know if you saw that. I saw the young cubs were fighting over some kill that they had. It was a very, very, very interesting sighting. Just the behavior of anim animals, the behavior of, of the way in which they are in ecosystems is, is something that I've always quite enjoyed and interested by. So hopefully Ellie will help us find some painted wolves. And if you don't know much about wild, wild dogs, they move in packs. If you're new to Safari Live, this is a live experience. So everything that we're about to see now is happening in real time. And wild dogs are diurnal animals that move at rapid, rapid rates, far places they can travel. And they often hunt during the day. So they are really, really exciting really exciting animal to watch during the day. Just going to get an update. Stations, I'm not able to get onto the Eastern Radio. Is it possible if I could get an update on the wild dogs? Thank you. They've just crossed into Arethusa. So Arethusa is right next to us over here. So let's see if we can get there as quick as possible. Let's go and find these wild logs. See, the signs in front of us will tell us where Little Gowry is. Little Gowry is where they were earlier, which is the property to our left here. So what is thought to have happened, wild dogs have headed into this bit of country. At this stage, we've got to try and listen for any vehicles that are driving quite manically around here because that will give them away quite quickly. Let's see if I can get onto this eastern channel. Stations, can I please get an update on the wild dogs? This is Sam from Buyatella. towards the airstrip on Arethusa. Will that help me get close to that sighting? I don't quite understand what that is saying to me. down this way to the top part of the airstrip and we'll be able to look down the airstrip. All right, let me just go on a search for these wild dogs. In the meantime, let's go see James with his white-tailed mongoose. Very exciting, everybody. I hope we get there. Uh, they do seem like they've moved a massive distance. I mean, when we heard of them, unless it's another pack, they were, well, not too far from where we're sitting now, just over there inside. We've just come out of Cheetah Plains, just inside Chitwa Chitwa. We found their tracks earlier, and as we found them, we heard that they were being viewed on Chitwa Chitwa. They obviously moved off further to the west, crossed directly across Vuyatela or Juma, which is the very far kind of strip of land, or far strip of road that you can see in the way distance there. That's a good sort of five or six kilometers away. 
and then they've crossed off into Arethusa. So with any luck, Sam will find them. If they're moving at that speed and that far north, it's possible they'll go on to Simbambili. My only thought, and I don't know this, is that they just seem to have got to where they are incredibly fast. And I wonder if there aren't two packs operating around here. But as we get closer to this area, we'll find out. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure it's only one pack. So we came out of che Cheetah Plains when we heard that the dogs were coming, but they've gone a long way from where we're going to be able to get. Shannon, um, you know that we have said that humans are the apex predator out here, but you're still curious to know whether any of them come into the uh, boundaries of the of the camps absolutely they do uh, we get monkeys in the camp we get hyena in the camp at night very frequently uh, Kirsten had an experience where she caught one fossicking through the dustbin the other night she shouted at it and it didn't see her as the apex predator at all so she shut her door and left it alone um, they are at night animals like leopards and lions and hyenas will be much less likely to see us as apex predators than they do during the course of the day because we are diurnal. But that line is slightly blurred. Elephants will often come into camp, uh, if, or especially during a drought. So yes, the camps are by no means some sort of uh, area that animals will avoid by default all the time. But they do avoid human noise. They do avoid the... Um, the smell of human beings in our camps, except for maybe the hyenas. But lions will come through every so often. Our particular camp, though, ends in a sort of, I mean, it, it, it would block, it would corner an animal. And an animal very se seldom will take the risk to be cornered. And so in our particular camp, not very often. Some of the camps are fenced. Boyatella at and Galago at Juma are fenced. I'm just worried we're going to lose signal here. So while Sam is moving to the wild dogs, we're just going to turn the engine off and drift slowly down here and see if we can find something interesting to tell you about. We found a giraffe today, Brian. Aren't we lucky? And two impala. It was a splendid morning. Splendid, splendid morning. And the Steenbok, which unfortunately ran away. Monkey Man, a good question. What would happen if two wild dog packs ran into each other? They might have a fight. They do often have fights. But it's an unlikely thing to happen because their territories are so... Well, not their territories, their home ranges are so vast. We get two packs that come through this area. Um, both of them have got sort of home ranges of about 45,000 uh, hectares each. So that is... I mean, that's 450 square kilometers each which in miles or acres, it's about a thousand acres each per home range. So it's unlikely that they'll come across each other. If they do, they can have a bit of a fight. I don't think it's, I think it's very seldom going to be fatal though. They don't like to take those sorts of risks. We really are going to run out of signal here. Rebecca, do you want me to risk it? Shall I rush through this drainage line? Or shall I stop here? Okay, here we go, everybody. Hold on tight. You're going to get black screen. We should be absolutely fine from the top here. We just get to the top, then we'll slow down again. There we go. 
So this is Torchwood, just to the right-hand side, where Karula and her babies are supping on the diker. And not too far from here, either. It really is not a long way from where we are now. And her territory, it continues to amaze me how vast her territory is. You know, she's a 12-year-old leopard, so, I mean, she's not quite in her prime. She's a little bit over the hill. I don't mean that in a bad way, but, I mean, sort of prime age would be about nine. So, I guess Shadow is pretty much in her prime. Um, but her territory is vast. I mean, it extends all the way west, almost to Arethusa, and all the way into Torchwood here, down south into Chitwa Chitwa and Little Gauri, and up into basically the whole of Vuyatela. She's the only female that spends um, or concentrates her time on Vuyatela or Juma. So it's really impressive. The great queen. She certainly is. Right, we're now back on Juma. I missed that. What happened? Did you... Did you still got her? Why haven't wild dogs what? No, Rebecca, you're gone. You've left my life. Hmm? I don't know. Are we still live? No. Rebecca, we're live. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happened, everyone. Um, the wire or something has come adrift. This is still in. No, that's all fine. Go again with the question, Rebecca. I'll relate. These are just very cheap, nasty things, I feel. Oh, suddenly I've got you again. Sort of, not really. No, you're going to have to go with that, Brian. What was that? No. Sorry, this is dreadful, everybody. I will, I, if I can't make it work now, I'll just open the comms up. Which means then you'll hear Rebecca's dulcet tones yourself. Mm. <laughs> I'm just going to pin that in there for now. It won't look very neat. Sorry about this. We're just giving Sam some time to get into position with those dogs, if he can get there, if they're not rushing into Simbambili. All right, try again, Rebecca. Good luck. Is she speaking? Yes. No, I've got nothing. Why haven't wild dogs successfully adapted to lesser land space as a means of survival? Prey is plentiful. James Hendry's old hat. Right, that James Hendry's old hat. I'll answer your question for you, and then I'm going to, unfortunately, open up the comms so we can hear Rebecca. Rebecca, don't swear. Uh, you're now on live television. Um, James Hendry's old hat. You want to know why... It, well, you heard Brian asking, asking the question there. I... I mean, the, the species is extremely well adapted, and it's only in the last 200 years or so that their habitat has been so reduced that they've become endangered through con contact with domestic dogs and through an inability to move into areas uh, where there aren't other wild dogs. So, I mean, over, that's just such a very short time for there to have been any kind of adaptive change. Nice question, though. Thank you very much. Second. Question, James Richard. Uh, Why yeah. is the Lion Pride <laughs> Coalition's gene pool kept diverse in something like a closed system? James Richard. Now, I'm just going to ask Rebecca if you actually heard that, then I won't have to repeat it. Did you hear that, Rebecca? Did you hear your own voice? Uh, yes, we did hear it. Ah, you did. There we go. So, James Richard... I think I may have actually forgotten the question. I was just so amazed. Hang on one second. Ah, yeah. Pinzan. Milante Masholo. Masholo Mane. Yeah, Mangene. 
Ara tuza ya. Okay. Go. Okay. Okay. Go. Enjoy. Sorry, Becca, can you go again with James's question? Ah, right, I've got it now. Um, Lion Pride genetics are kept diverse in a closed system. Well, I mean, a closed system would be something like, I suppose, Pinder. Pinder is a small reserve in Natal, great success story. Uh, it's about now probably about 25,000 hectares. That is a closed system, and the only way to keep the Lion Prides uh, diverse or the genetics diverse is to take lions out and bring new ones in. So you swap with other smaller reserves and that keeps the genetics uh, sort of the pool fairly deep. In an area like this, this is not a closed system. It's eight, well I mean it's, 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 as near, it's as near as anything to an open system. It's eight million acres of land and so it's highly unlikely that you would ever have a genetic problem here where you'd have a genetic bottleneck unless you had a major kind of extinction event in the area. With a closed system, you've got to take them out physically and put them back in physically. We are heading towards the Umlulwati drainage line now, but in Rusty, that should be fine. I feel dreadfully sad. I really genuinely do that Karula is not with us anymore. I felt so excited going out every day for the last three days, even though we didn't see her. Well, I knew she was in here somewhere, and I feel bereft, like she's rejected me in some way. I've got to tell you, it's not a nice feeling. I'm not, I'm not joking. I hope she comes back. She better come back. Those little ones. Anyway, let us hope Samuel manages to find the dogs before the end of the drive. Rebecca, is he anywhere near them? Do you know? Get an update from Peter here. We should be able to see them. Hello, Peter. James, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. You had a good dog sighting today? Yes. And good. You go to Safari Driveway yep. and to the first road to your right. Yes. At the fork, keep there, okay. right there. Okay, cool. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, in David Okay, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Okay, thank Enjoy. you. Bye. Bye, bye That's Peter Robankoro and apparently, as you heard Rebecca say, Stan is standing by to get into the dog sighting. Obviously, there's now a great conflagration of vehicles trying to get in there. Wild dogs, extremely exciting. And if you could have heard the radio from Cheetah Plains where I was listening to the sighting going on just in here, you would have heard the, uh, well, it's just mayhem. Everyone wants to see them. So we've got to be very patient and careful about it. So that will make Sam, um, he's seen dogs today, elephants today, buffalo today. I suppose we haven't, we have seen elephants, haven't we, Brian? We, we saw bottoms. We, we saw bottoms. Yes. And, we saw and the giraffe, yes. And two impala, yes. And a dead white-tailed mongoose. Yes. And we took some amazing photographs. Yes, yes. Now, of course, we're in a position now where the final control, who can normally be as rude as they like to us, uh, is unable to do that because, of course, they are on open communications. It must be very, must be very, very troublesome for them. Here, <laughs> here are further Impala. Shall we stop at them? Steve in Idaho. Do any of the game lodges in Sabi San make use of aerial drones to assist in tracking? Steve in Idaho. Hello, Steve. Um, we do sometimes use drones, not so much for tracking. I mean, when we were doing the Big Cat Week specials, we went into a rehearsal one day and we had a wonderful wild dog sighting where we just couldn't keep up in the vehicles and Andrew flew the drone over the top of them and we got the most incredible views of these dogs on the hunt. 
but I don't think anybody by default uses um, drones for tracking. And the other thing about it is that we're not allowed to fly drones here anymore because of the rhino poaching scourge, so you've got to get special permission. But I think we will, we're in the process of doing that. We're also in the process of looking at getting a thermal imaging drone, which will do precisely what you're suggesting. It will give us the capability to look at animals at night and track them at night using thermal imaging. Thank you, Steve. Ah, yeah! Closing, please link to Sam with wild dog. Oh, Sam's got the wild dog. Let's go across to him straight away. We have managed to find the wild dogs, everyone. We're going to see if we can get a better position, but isn't this great? I'm so glad we managed to find them. We were driving around like headless chickens for the last 10 minutes. You just see them. Make them just lying down over there, which is not often what how we find them. Normally see them running around. I am bought. Okay, cool. Let's see if we can get a, a nicer angle of them. We've got a few vehicles here, we're not the only ones. Let's make our way around. We found the painted wolves. Very, very stoked. Very, very stoked. Yeah. Huh? Backwards. Sorry, couldn't get through there. Let's rather get a, another angle of this. How's it? Yeah, we go. We go one right to the left. So we're just going to try and get a good position. Thanks. There we go. Yourself. <laughs> no, no, you cannot complain. I don't think any of the viewers are either. We're very happy to see the painted walls. Look at that colours. Oh, look at those colours, everyone. It's not often we get to see them lying down in this position. You get a close up on the colours of that. Look at that. Screenshot that if you want to get a better picture. Let's have a look on their faces. Can you see that blood? Oh, they've most likely made a kill a couple of hours ago, or maybe even in the last hour. And there's blood you can see on the front fur, top of its head. So we found the wild dogs and they are looking quite well fed. One of them is getting up. See him behind the bush there. But they might just lie down for a while. The last time we were with the wild dogs, they didn't sit for less than two minutes. But what's so interesting about the wild dogs is they can get up and move at any moment. And what I'm interested to find out more about wild dogs is, you know, they have an alpha and a, an alpha female and an alpha male. And they're the only ones that can have cubs. Or pups, sorry, not cubs, pups. And they will control the way in which the, this pack will move, the alpha male and female. Monkey Man would like to know how 
big is the wild dog compared to that of the German Shepherd? Well, monkey man, they are quite, I mean, just from what I'm looking, quite, quite similar. Quite similar, very, very similar, actually. Probably the wild dog's probably just a little shorter to, to that of a, of a German sh Shepherd. Would you say that, Vildi? I'd say slightly smaller. Slightly smaller. Obviously, a little bit leaner. Just going to give them a position so they can do them. So we managed to find the wild dogs this morning. They are going to be lying up. Hopefully they're going to move in a northerly direction or north, north kind of east to our property. But while we're here, let's just say thanks to everyone. Thank you, Rebecca, behind the camera or behind as a director and cameraman Viem for helping me out on these roads. What a fantastic morning we've had. We'll see you on the Sunset Safari. Stay well and see you later.